stay connected with the world through WeOn. Like the page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter for new alerts. Instagram for videos and images. And the website for the latest news, views and analysis. WeOnews.com. World is one. tells you stories which others won't and tonight we will tell you about this new strategic map that is being drawn they say your enemy's enemy is your friend is that the foundation of the new defense bridge between india and america this is what separates us from others who claim to be telling you global stories that matter in the last 3 days beyond has been traveling across syria you are in latakia city right now tell us what is the situation on ground at gravitas we don't just tell you stories from selected countries from around the world 2 years since the myanmar military coup the people of myanmar continue to live in a nightmare because it does not suit their propaganda or because they are too scared to speak truth to power The stress of our world can take it Welcome to We On Live broadcast from New York City. I'm Susan Tehrani. First, let's take a look at this hour's headlines. IAEA Chief Rafael Grossi visits the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant in Ukraine. Europe's largest nuclear facility is currently under Russian occupation. After Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky invites Xi Jinping to Ukraine, China says it maintains communications with all parties involved in the Ukraine war. Kremlin says that it will defend the interests of its athletes and continue talks with the IOC to protect their interests. Olympic chiefs had recommended that Russian athletes compete as individuals under a neutral flag. A Norwegian magazine says that the number of operational nuclear warheads rose sharply in 2022. Nuclear weapons ban monitor says present nuclear bombs have destruction powers equal to 135,000 Hiroshima bombs. Indian Wells champions Carlos Alcaraz and Elena Rybakina stay on course to compete the Sunshine Double. Alcaraz cruises to the Miami Open quarters while Rybakina advances to the last four in the women's draw.
China has warned the U.S. and Taiwan that any meeting between the Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen and the U.S. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy would be seen as serious provocation. The Taiwanese president is scheduled to depart on a 10-day tour of Central America with a stopover here in the United States. According to reports, she's expected to meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Before that, she's expected to give a closed-door speech in New York hosted by the Hudson Institute. However, China has now threatened to retaliate if she meets McCarthy. Issuing a statement, China's Taiwan Affairs Office said, quote, if she contacts U.S. House Speaker McCarthy, it will be another provocation that seriously violates the one China principle. The meet will harm China's sovereignty and territorial integrity and also destroy peace and stability in the Taiwanese Strait. Beijing further said that it opposes this and will take measures to resolutely fight back. The latest warning by Beijing comes a day after former president of Taiwan said that we are all Chinese. This is the first time in more than 70 years a Taiwanese leader made such a statement on Chinese soil. Meanwhile, a senior U.S. official has said that China should not overreact and use a stopover in the United States by the Taiwanese president as a pretext for aggression against the democratically ruled island of Taiwan. Tsai's trip also comes a few days after Honduras snapped its ties with Taiwan in favor of China. Okay, well, for more on this, we are joined by Elizabeth Loris, adjunct fellow at the Pacific Forum and president of E. Loris Consulting. She's joining us live from Washington, D.C. Elizabeth, welcome back to Weon. First of all, this seems like deja vu all over again with that trip made by Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan just a while back, but now it's the other way around. And secondly, what is the United States trying to do right now, considering the fact that it insists that its one China policy has not changed? The one China policy has not changed. The United States has never said that Taiwan belongs to the PRC. That's China's view. And so uh, the administration is not pushing this visit. Um, as you know, in the U.S., we have three branches of government. So Congress um, can do what it wants uh, separate from the administrative um, branch. And Nancy Pelosi, when she went to Taiwan last August, that was indeed uh, considered provocative, uh, provocative in, in Beijing. And so um, McCarthy, Speaker McCarthy, said that he wanted to meet Tsai Ing-wen, but he knew to go to Taiwan would be provocative. And last year, after Pelosi's visit, China upped the ante against Taiwan. You know, China cannot... Um, hit back. You know, it has it has uh, pledged, sworn, resolute response, resolute countermeasures. Well, it's not going to take those against the U.S. It's going to take <laughs> those against Taiwan. And so by McCarthy saying, OK, let's meet in the U.S., he still gets to meet Tsai Ing-wen, but hopefully mutes those countermeasures. And, you know, is there a growing concern that more countries are sort of shying away Regarding their support for Taiwan, only 13 countries now have official relations with Taiwan. And do you think that's why perhaps Taiwan's leader has decided to take this trip? Taiwan's leaders periodically visit their diplomatic allies. Uh, I believe this is uh, Tsai Ing-wen's fourth or sixth trip to see her diplomatic allies um, in this side of the world. So, so that's not unusual. Um, so uh, in the past, I'm talking maybe like 20 years ago, um, there were indeed layovers in the United States. However, uh, high-level government officials would not meet a president of Taiwan. Over time, they've become um, a bit more um, dramatic in the sense that 
um, especially since the passage of the Taiwan Travel Act in 2018, higher level officials are meeting uh, between um, the U.S. and Taiwan. There still is that unspoken rule that no administration high level official will meet with the Taiwan president. And so that's still going on. Now, Tsai Ing-wen, um, she cannot back down um, in the face of China's threats. That will make her look weak if the United States capitulated and makes the U.S. look weak. And so once they said they were going, once McCarthy said he was going to meet with Tsai Ing-wen, they have to ca carry through. But it needs to be done carefully uh, because China is very powerful today and it has an innumerable host of things that it could do against Taiwan in retaliation. Elizabeth Loris, thank you so much for that and helping us make a sense of all of this. I look forward to speaking to you again very soon. You're welcome. Is close Indian ally and neighbor Bhutan showing signs of leaning away from India and towards China? Bhutan Prime Minister said China has an equal say in resolving the Dukalam issue. Speaking to a Belgian daily, Lotte Chering spoke to length about territorial disputes with China and regarding the measures being taken to resolve the same. Sharing's statement on a Dokalam plateau dispute with China marks a significant shift in the ongoing dispute over the strategically important area. The plateau lies at the tri-juncture of India, China, and Bhutan. The region has been a source of tension between the three countries since a military standoff in 2017. Speaking to the Belgian daily La Libre, Schering said, It is not up to Bhutan alone to solve the problem. There are three of us. There is no big or small country. There are three equal countries, each counting for a third. Schering also denied there was any intrusion by the Chinese into Bhutan's territory, be it in the form of villages or settlement, as reported earlier. Chering's statement indicates Bhutan's willingness to negotiate the tri-junctions status in Duklam. China aims to shift the tri-junction southward, which would make the entire Duklam plateau legally part of China, a move that India rejects. The prime minister added that Bhutan hopes to complete the demarcation of territories with China within, quote, one or two meetings. This indicates that a resolution of boundary issues with Beijing could be expected soon. The interview raises speculations that the flurry of China-Bhutan talks could lead to a settlement on Duklam unfavorable to India. Bhutan may agree to it in exchange for a settlement of the disputed Bhutanese territory to the north. But the interview is not all that might be bothering New Delhi. Last week, Bhutan signed an agreement with Bangladesh. As per the deal, Bangladesh will open up three of its ports for Thimpu. This is being done to facilitate Bhutan's trade with other countries in order to reduce its dependence on India for transit. Wedged between China and India, Bhutan earlier depended solely on Indian ports for supply of essential goods. Bhutan has historically maintained close relations with India. But the recent maneuvers suggest that Thimpu may be shifting its approach, potentially at India's expense. A massive blaze at a detention center in a city in northern Mexico on the U.S.-Mexican border on Tuesday killed at least 39 people. And the latest development in the incident is as shocking as the incident. Recent CCTV footage on the incident reveals a possible cause of the fire. The migrants in the video can be seen placing mattresses against the bars and setting them on fire. But what's more disturbing is that the guards on duty don't make even a minor effort to save the detainees as they casually walk out the room. 
and then the room is filled with smoke in seconds. Mexican officials have confirmed the authenticity of the video. The incident in the video was soon followed by rows of bodies under silver sheets. The incident at the Ciudad Juarez Migrant Detention Center has drawn several criticisms from right groups. Authorities have identified the dead and injured as belonging to Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador. The migrants setting fire to the mattresses, which eventually became the reason for a far bigger fire came after a long dispute between authorities and migrants in Ciudad Juarez. Hundreds of people have been waiting in such detention centers for an opportunity to cross into the United States. Earlier, more than 30 migrants shelters and advocacy groups complained about the criminalization of migrants and asylum seekers in the city. In recent times, Mexico has emerged as the world's third most populous destination for asylum seekers. Israel put a new version of its OFEC spy satellite into orbit. The Defense Ministry says that it would enhance around the clock regional monitoring as the country braces for a possible showdown with Iran. More in our next report. At 2.10 a.m. local time, Israel launched yet another spy satellite into space. A Shavit launch vehicle shot the satellite into space from Israel's Balmachim spaceport. A few hours later, the satellite successfully entered orbit and began transmitting data. The OFEC-13 satellite is the latest in a line of Israeli observation assets in space. It will provide the military with better quality images than its predecessors. Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant oversaw the launch. Gallant hailed the event as yet another important example of the Israeli defense establishment's groundbreaking innovation. The satellite's development and production were led by the Defense Ministry's Space and Satellite Administration. Israel launched its first satellite, OFEC-1, into space in 1988, and it was not until 1995 that Israel launched a reconnaissance satellite, capable of photographing the Earth. Israel is one of a small number of countries in the world that operate reconnaissance satellites. This gives it advanced intelligence gathering capabilities, which the Jewish state deems essential for its national security. Bureau Report, we are World is One. Artificial intelligence has taken the world by storm with the release of Chat GPT 4. Doll automation seems to have been thrown out of the window. New age tech is taking rapid strides and it's getting smarter every day. Step of the way as well. However, with these advancements comes the risk of job loss. Goldman Sachs predicts that it could affect more than 300 million jobs worldwide. Take a look at this report to know which sectors could be hit the worst. There is no stopping the massive phenomenon called AI that everyone is talking about. AI is raging, AI is here, and AI is here to stay. It all began with the release of artificial intelligence-powered chatbot ChatGPT on the 30th of November. That has presumably made it the biggest newsmaker of the year. ChatGPT developed by OpenAI that can do practically anything. It can produce scripts, stories, codings, snippets and much more on demand just by feeding in the needs and whims of the user. As the ChatGPT saga continues, the latest release of ChatGPT4 on the 14th of March has inevitably created a bigger stir. 
GPT 4's ability to convert simple text into different formats of media has taken content creation to a whole new level. From text summarization to app creation, from writing stories to delivering answers to any question under the sun, Chat GPT 4 can do it all. But is that really good news? Is automation the death of human creativity and endeavors? A recent research conducted by Goldman Sachs has concluded that around two-thirds of the jobs in the U.S. and European markets will be exposed to automation, causing a major disruption in the labor market worldwide. While it is a rapidly growing technology, currently only a slim margin of 5% of the jobs can be completely automated. Over time, almost half the activities across all sectors would be impacted by automation offered by dynamic AI. The administrative and legal sectors would be the most susceptible to job losses. Nearly 46% of administrative jobs and 44% of the legal jobs are most likely to bear the brunt of the pressures posed by the use of AI. And it doesn't stop there. AI poses a major threat to the creative pursuits of humans, wiping away jobs and increasing economic inequalities on a global scale. However, with all the threats posed by this revolutionary technology, it has the potential of improving the economy by boosting the GDP by nearly 7% over a period of just 10 years. Just because it can mimic the human brain in a sized fashion doesn't mean it can replicate the human capability of taking pragmatic decisions. It would still require human aid to navigate its way around tasks, thereby making the degree of transformation variable across sectors. That being said, physically intensive professions such as construction and maintenance would still mostly remain risk-averse. And if used wisely, AI might increase the productivity growth by just under 1.5% over 10 years. While much of it seems condensed in words and figures and the actual roadmap to the story of AI still remains a mystery. For now, one can only wait for time to unravel the angels and demons of this new age revolution called AI. Bureau Report, we on World is One. In the Google versus Competition Commission of India saga, it is the tech giant that will have to pay the penalty. This after the National Company Law Appellate Tribunal rejected Google's plea and stated that there was no violation of natural justice conducted by the CCI. That means the internet major will now have to cough up more than $150 million to the fair trade regulator. A two-member bench that was hearing Google's plea has also asked the company to ensure that the penalty is transferred within 30 days. The CCI had last year imposed a hefty fine on Google for its anti-competitive practices in relation to Android mobile devices. The CCI had alleged that Google forced its OEMs to pre-install apps by abusing its dominant position. However, the NCLAT has allowed marginal relief to Google by striking down CCI's direction requiring it to allow access to its Play Store API. The NCLAT order could have significant implications for other big tech companies. That's because the appellate's decision could set a precedent for how dominant tech players operate and engage with the OEMs and app developers. Jennifer Aniston and Adam Sandler brought a piece of Paris to Hollywood for the premiere of their latest action comedy, Murder Mystery 2. More details in our next report.
expert in Zurich have been applying the final touches to Trinity. A 3.9 meter tall T-Rex skeleton has been flown in all the way from Arizona, United States. Trinity is not a single specimen, but fossils from three different T-Rexes and is scheduled to go on auction in late April. We leave you with the visuals. tells you stories which others won't. And tonight we will tell you about this new strategic map that is being drawn. They say your enemy's enemy is your friend. Is that the foundation of the new defense bridge between India and America? This is what separates us from others who claim to be telling you global stories that matter. In the last three days, Beyond has been traveling across Syria. You are in Latakia city right now. Tell us what is the situation on ground at Gravitas. We don't just tell you stories from selected countries from around the world. Two years since the Myanmar military coup, the people of Myanmar continue to live in a nightmare. Because it does not suit their propaganda or because they are too scared to speak truth to power. The stress of our world can take a toll on our physical and emotional health. Here, in New York's Catskill Mountains, lies a luxurious place of healing called Yo One Wellness Center. The Yo One Wellness Center provides half a million square feet of natural methods to manage diabetes, hypertension, chronic pain, obesity, depression, anxiety, and other conditions. We use the traditions of centuries-old natural science from India, yoga, Ayurveda, 